Hello, everyone. My name is Neville Smith. I am the Director of Education for Eve University. I want to thank you for joining me today for this lecture on how I became an Eve billionaire. Uh, first, let's make sure that I'm coming through okay. If you're hearing me all right, do give me a wave in the class.euni chat channel now, if you could. Wow, we have a big crowd here today. Obviously, there's a lot of people who are interested in uh, wanting to become a billionaire. Well, and good for you. Uh, becoming a billionaire is probably one of the smartest things I did in the game. And I intend to uh, use this particular lecture. It's going to be a little different than some of our standard classes. It's mostly going to be me indulging in my own ego and uh, talking about myself. I'm just going to share you my uh, or share with you my story on how I accumulated uh, over a billion esque in the game. I uh, will tell you that I made a lot of mistakes and uh, and had a few successes along the way. And so I hope to share with you today some of the things that I learned so that you can get to that magic billion dollar billion esque mark uh, a little bit faster than I. I am an Eve billionaire. I'm certainly not the richest player in the game by far, and I'm sure there are many, many other players who have much larger amounts of ISK in their accounts than I do. However, I uh, am very proud to be a member of the EVE Billionaire Club, and I will tell you that it wasn't easy. It took me about a year and a half to accomplish, which is a long time of uh, playing EVE. I know that some of you who are attending have been working on accumulating wealth in the game and certainly have gotten close, if not surpassed, the billion ISK mark a lot faster than I did. But uh, uh, certainly it took me a while to get there. Uh, Carathel, good question. Uh, your question is, uh, am I a billionaire in terms of the amount of pure ISK or in total assets? Now, I'm talking about liquid assets, pure ISK. Uh, I, c I can't even tell you how much I'm worth uh, with all of the other ships and assets that I have in the game. So, uh, it's, But it's definitely nice to have more than a billion ISK uh, in the bank, so to speak, at all times. And uh, I'm very proud to have that amount, although it took me a long time to get there for sure. With the help of some fellow unis and some diligent research and a lot of experiments and more than a few lucky breaks, I now keep a minimum of one billion ISK in my accounts at all times. And it's certainly possible to play EVE without amassing any kind of real wealth in the game and still have a lot of fun. I know many people in the game uh, have been playing for a long time and, and have very, very small bank accounts. Uh, so the question is, why make the effort to do it? And for me, there were three reasons. The first reason was more ISK means more options in the game. If you want to fly Tech 2 or Tech 3 or Faction or Capital Ships, or if you want to own your own PAWS or play your own Starbase, or use advanced faction implants or modules, really shiny, cool stuff, you're going to need ISK, and you're going to need a lot of ISK. Shiny goodies definitely cost, and I wanted to experience those options in the game, so ISK making became a really early focus for me. The second reason was that more ISK means more free play. If you can generate about 300 million ISK per month per character, you can buy Plex and then play for free, those pilot license extensions, and you can cash those in to play for free. Uh, in actual practice, I rarely do this, but it's always nice to have the option. I always find other reasons to use my ISK than to spend it on Plex. But there are other players in the game. I know that Erdolf Darar, our uh, director of diplomacy or public relations, uh, routinely uses much of his ISK that he earns in the games to pay for his characters by purchasing Plex, and there are many people who do so as well. The third reason is that ISK is one of the primary benchmarks of success in EVE. Uh, some people measure their success in EVE by the number of kills that they have on the kill board or by the amounts of skill points that they possess. Some use the types of ships that they can fly, others by the quantity and quality of friends that they develop in the game. But one of the most common measures of success in EVE is the amount of ISK that you have in the bank. And for me, that became an intriguing goal. How can I maximize my ISK making ability and how much ISK can I actually accumulate? And it's a challenge that I'm still learning to overcome. And it's one of the things that frankly makes EVE fun for me. Uh, some unis have noticed that I have a pause on one of my alt characters, and I like to fly around in shiny, expensive ships. 
And some of them have asked me, where did I get the ISK to afford such luxuries? And in this lecture, I'm going to tell you my story and hopefully give you a few insights about how you too can become an EVE billionaire. Now, there are many paths to becoming rich in EVE. There is no one right way. Uh, you will encounter, encounter people in the game who will tell you, you have to be uh, you know, a pirate, or you have to be a scammer, or you have to be a mission runner or a station trader. The first bit of advice that I'm going to give you is ignore all of these people. It's always interesting to talk to them and figure out how it is that they were able to accumulate a certain amount of wealth through the various things that they do. Um, but frankly, the most important thing that's, uh, that you have to bear in mind as you're figuring out how you're going to accumulate ISK in the game is what is your style of play? I tend to be a loner, and I prefer game activities that don't require a lot of other people. It's not that I don't love all you folks, and I enjoy fleeting with you and doing things with you, but frankly, like to do things that I can rely only on myself. So I tend to be more of a loner in the game, and I tend to gravitate towards those kinds of activities in EVE that are more solo activities. I also like puzzles and unraveling complex systems into something more approachable and practical. I like being the good guy, wearing the white hat, if you will. Uh, and in short, I am uh, really what's known in EVE as a Care Bear, and I freely admit that I am an especially cowardly Care Bear at that. My tolerance for risk is especially low. Those who enjoy more risky activities would likely choose a much different path than I did, and I encourage you to adjust the kinds of activities. There are many ways to become a billionaire in EVE, and some of them are more risky than others. So don't interpret what I'm about to share with you as the right way to do it. In fact, for many of you, it's probably the exact wrong way to accumulate this uh, level of ISK and, and, and get a big bank account. You might want to do some slightly different things, and that's completely all right. Uh, I'm just going to share with you how I did it. And if it sounds appealing to you, feel free to copy the things that worked for me. Good question, Grandel. Have I ever purchased any of the guides for ideas? In fact, I have. And I will tell you that every guide that I have actually paid real world money for has been a complete waste of money. <laughs> Do not buy any of the guides that are available on how to become rich in Eve because none of them are worth it. The only one that's any good and Alicia has just pointed it out, is ISK 3.0. That's the only guide that I found to be useful in giving you some ideas of how you can accumulate wealth in the game. Every other one, and I've bought several of them, actually, I found uh, material that's in there that's available and free resources. In fact, one of the guides that I purchased reprinted much of what's available on the EVE University Wiki, and I actually paid money for that. So don't be fooled. <laughs> Everything you need to know to become an EVE billionaire is available in the public. Public domain. Now, I discovered Eve in the summer of 2009 and created this character, Neville Smith, on July 26th. And it didn't take me very long to realize that Eve wasn't going to be a very uh, easy game for me to master. In fact, after running some of the initial tutorial missions, it was plainly obvious that I had no clue whatsoever about what the game was really all about. I can see why many people give up EVE after starting a trial account. Uh, the amount of information that one needs to learn in order to do even simple operations can be very intimidating. But even scarier is the fact that EVE is a really harsh place. If you don't figure out how to fend for yourself, you're not going to last very long. And I really like that aspect of EVE. I resolved that I wasn't going to let a stupid game humiliate me. So I started doing some research to figure out how not to die. And my early days in EVE were pretty comedic, if not outright pathetic. I could barely figure out how to fly anywhere, much less master any way to make any real currency in the game. In fact, I wandered into low sec, not having any idea about how dangerous it was, and promptly lost a noob ship. I still remember how hard my heart was beating when I ran away in my pod, which was <laughs> nice of them to let me do that. It was frightening. It was also exciting, and I was totally hooked. And I was also dirt poor and had absolutely nothing in the bank whatsoever was rapidly running out of money. And the idea of cruising around in a poorly fitted frigate all the time didn't sound very appealing, and I knew I had to do something different. I figured I'd better join a corporation if I wanted to survive in the game, and after doing a little research, I discovered EVE University. And the uni sounded tailor-made for a complete noob like me, and I eagerly applied. 
my interview with Cortanus. How many people here remember Cortanus? He leads, used to lead the uh, Dragon Slayer operations. He was my personnel officer. We used to call them recruitment officers back then. We went through the interview together. It was very thorough, but it was quite fun. And I could see that the uni was the perfect home for me and that I would learn a lot there. And I still feel that way. Almost two years later, I'm still learning. I certainly have a lot more to learn about EVE. The depth of this game is fantastic. And so I don't see any reason to leave the uni, at least for now. Now, after joining EVE University, it became obvious that I needed to think seriously about finding some sort of reliable form of self-employment in the game if I was going to build a bank account larger than a few thousand ISK. Uh, mining seemed like an obvious first choice. First, I had the nominal skills to do it. Second, it was easy. Third, it looked like something that could be developed into increasing amounts of ISK over time. So I became a miner, and there wasn't much more thinking uh, in that decision than that. I slapped a mining laser onto a uh, Navitas and headed it for the nearest belt. And the first thing that I learned, of course, is that mining is extremely dull. After figuring out that most rats in high sec are easily repelled with a drone, I realized I didn't need to panic when one appeared. I also learned that mining is essentially trading game time for ISK, and that efficiency was the name of the game. Now, since my real-life job at the time involved staring into a computer screen most of the time, I simply kept an EVE client running in the background in mind all day, uh, the only downside was listening to the constant brzzzt, brzzzt, you know, sound that the lasers make at minimum volume all day, and the noise became my constant companion in the office. I did get a lot of weird looks from my neighbors, that's for sure. Um, in fact, one of the things that I was doing to raise money is I figured out that uh, the way that you maximize your uh, income from mining is to just be able to mine consistently and not shuttle back and forth from the station. So I actually sl uh, slapped a, uh, uh, a mining laser on an Iteron and uh, simply let it run for four or five hours at a time. Not the most effective way to mine, that's for sure. Started jet can mining initially, and after getting my hull stolen a couple of times by can flippers, I became become the, this idea of putting a mining laser and letting that run all day. Now, talk about slow, painful mining. It took about four to five hours to fill the industrial's hole, but it didn't really matter to me because as long as the lasers were running, I was making ISK. Meanwhile, I read Halada's mining guide and focused my skill training on mining and refining. How many people here have not yet read Halada's Mining Guide. Give me a wave in the class.euni chat channel. Halada's Mining Guide should be required reading by everybody who plays EVE. Actually gives you some appreciation for what real mining is all about. Halada's Mining Guide was the first time I figured out that I needed to focus my skill training on something that would actually be uh, productive. Uh, and so I started to focus my skill training on mining and refining, and slowly my production levels improved. And for the first time, my ISK balance uh, started to move in a positive direction. I found I was making about five or six million ISK for about four or five hours of work. And this is after playing the game for about a month or so. Now, I can hear some of you snickering in the background out there at this very paltry return. But uh, I would urge you to remember when you first started playing EVE. And back then, even 10 million ISK seemed like an astronomical sum, I'm sure, to some of you. Uh, personally, I was delighted to have the income at virtually no risk and for practically no effort. Uh, for me, mining became my first source of what I would consider to be near passive income. Over the next month or so, I developed the skills to fly a mining barge, and I still keep my good old reliable retriever in my hangar, pretty much for sentimental reasons. I spent a lot of time in that retriever. And uh, I trained for exhumers and ultimately got a hulk. It became obvious to me that improving mining skills were not going to be enough, however. If I was ever going to maximize my refining uh, efficiency and get the perfect refine, I had to get corporate standings of at least 6.67 somewhere, and the Minmatar mining obviously was the logical choice since I was being based in Aldrat. That, mean I, that meant I had to start running missions. I really, really did not want to become a mission runner. As I mentioned before, I am a cowardly person. Combat of any sort seems fraught with danger. 
And I'd already worked really hard to amass what few assets I had, a nice mining barge, a decently sized industrial, and a few Tech 1 modules. And I really didn't know how I could afford any significant losses. But fortunately, the uni made this a lot easier for me. I took advantage of the frigates, modules, and ammo and uh, that are available in the hangars and visited some Level 1 uh, Mimitar Mining Corporation agents. And soon I was good friends with Urtolf Artuna and Frida Gott and discovered that level one combat missions really weren't that hard. Uh, as soon as I had the skills to fly a destroyer, it became pretty easy. In fact, spent quite a bit of time in that catalyst. When I had enough standing and social skills to start level two missions, I eagerly rushed over to Aldrat 913 with, to visit with, uh, what is it, uh, Benrasur in Mion. And she gave me a nice combat mission, and I confidently steered my catalyst into it. And what I discovered is I quickly got swamped with angels and lost my ship in about two minutes. I was very angry, so I purchased another catalyst, got some modules and ammo from the uni hangar, and dove right back in and got exactly the same result. And once again, even more angry, pure, I was completely furious by this point. I bought another catalyst, got more modules, dove back in, and got exactly the same result. So in five minutes, I had squandered much of my hard-won savings by thinking all that one had to do in a mission was dive in, shoot everything, and leave. And clearly, I still had some more learning to do. And that's when I actually started attending EVE University classes. And at that point, a whole new world was open to me. I learned how to fit an armor tank. I figured out why destroyers make lousy ships for higher-level missions. I trained how to fly a cruiser and scraped enough is together to uh, buy a Celestis, which uh, certainly reminded me of my favorite frigate for level one missions, which was the Tristan. Uh, I trained drone skills and found out what wonderful devices they are for missions. And most importantly, I learned how to kite, uh, which is keeping at optimal range from targets. And then level two missions became fun, much to my amazement. And most importantly, I learned this vital lesson, never fly angry because you will lose your ships every time. With all this missioning, I was actually making pretty good progress getting my 6.67 standing with Minmatar Mining Corporation, which I needed for perfect refine. But I figured I would have to master level three missions to make any real money at missioning. And the idea of flying combat missions for ISK never really occurred to me before, but it didn't take me too long to realize that one could make more ISK per hour by flying level threes than they could from mining. So I trained for battle cruisers. Now, I love the Myrmidon. I think it's the coolest ship in the game. You can put double armor reppers and some nice active hardeners on it. It tanks damage very well. You can make it cap stable and still have some decent turret weapons on it. It packs all the drones you could ever need on a mission. If you have the skills, you can give it a passive shield tank that's every bit as good as a Drake, and that is definitely saying something. I don't think you can find a more flexible Tech 1 ship in EVE than the Myrmidon. And I did a lot of level 3 missions in my trusty Myrmidon, which I christened the Stout far more than I needed to get to my goal of perfect refine with MMC because it became such a lucrative source of income. I was knocking down a couple million ISK per mission on average, and after I converted my last surviving catalyst into a dedicated salvager to tidy up afterwards, that seemed like great money at the time. So once again, my bank account be uh, began to grow in a positive direction. Unfortunately, that's when I got cocky again. Um, it's been playing the game for about six months now. I really wanted to get into level four missions, as I heard that some of them could provide 10 million ISK or more in income. I really wasn't ready to buy a Dominix yet, much less fly one effectively. And I read around about a technique, however, on the uni wiki called drone seeding that seemed to be a plausible way to use a Myrmidon to crack some level fours. Uh, just enough skills to fit a Tech 2 tank by this point, so I decided to go ahead and give it a go. Uh, the MMC agent, uh, have a I have a love-hate relationship with the Level 4 uh, agents uh, located in Free to God. Uh, she's a Level 4 internal security agent, and I think she's probably one of the most devious little NPC agents in the game. And she gave me and the Stout a nice little Level 4 mission, and I tried using some drone seating in it. 
it worked perfectly, and I made about four million ISK. And I thought, hey, this isn't that hard. So I returned to the save agent for another try. Now I know that NPC agents aren't real, and I swear, however, that this agent likes to mess with me. This is the point at which she gave me Angel Extravaganza. How many people here have flown Angel Extravaganza? Give me a wave in the class.euni chat channel. Now, if you're not familiar with that mission, check it out on evesurvival.org. I did not do this at the time. Why, I don't know. But suffice it to say that a Myrmidon does not hold up very long against more than 1,700 DPS. So goodbye, Stout. I will always miss you. I decided to shelve my mission running career for a while uh, after that uh, rather sobering experience until I could properly fly a battleship and do level fours properly. And so it was time for me to find a less risky way to make ISK. I pulled out my old reliable Iteron 2 out of mothballs at that point, and I heard that some players make some def- decent money hauling things around in New Eden. And I was curious to see how lucrative it really could be. So during my missioning with Minimitar Mining, I had seen that the system of reset, which is just a couple of jumps away from Aldrat, had a lot of stations in it. In fact, it has 10 stations. Checking the market there, I also found that one could arrange some nice trade runs moving industrial goods between those stations. And I soon perfected a way to make about 5 million ISK an hour by shuttling water, garbage, cattle, and other items from one station to another completely in reset. I can only do that once a day, however. As soon as the daily needs were met of each of the stations, I had to wait for the next day for all the trade runs to reset, uh, no pun intended, uh, to do it all over again. I wanted to do this on a larger scale and make more ISK, and my research led me to EVE Central, a database of EVE market information, and most importantly, a trade route calculator that is housed there. And after some experimentation and many mistakes, I developed a repeatable, reliable system for generating about 5 to 6 million ISK per hour, all in high sec with hardly any effort. And if I worked the system really hard, I could make as much as 25 million ISK in the same amount of time. Uh, The idea of possibly earning enough to actually buy a Dominic's battleship every two hours really staggered me at the time, and I felt like I was swimming in cash. And for those of you who want to uh, see what that uh, process looks like, it's still on the wiki. Uh, Do a search for uh, using Eve Central to haul profitably, and you'll find it there. So I was really swimming in cash at this point, uh, but then unfortunately this thing called war came. In fact, several wars came all in a row, and I had to shelve my fledgling hauling empire. Uh, I spun a lot of ships in station, as we do when we first encounter our first war. I considered actually dropping from the uni at that time, but I was really learning a lot and didn't want to go independent. I flew in a few fleets, which was fun, but couldn't really do much as a Galenti E-War specialist in a Celestis, which is the cruiser I was flying at the time. Uh, Although I did become an expert at becoming a kill mail whore, uh, improving my own combat efficiency by flying in the shadows of far more superior uni pilots. And I want to thank all of them for that really good efficiency rating that I still have to this day on my kill board. War did amuse me for a while, uh, but I really never made money during wartime. But I didn't want to leave the uni, so I had to do something different. And so my main alt, Jano Brock, was born. Now, some of you may have seen Jano Brock flying around uh, in Aldrat. Uh, that is my alt. Uh, one thing I will reveal to all of you is that Jano Brock is actually my wife's real name in real life. And I told her that I named my alt character after her as a way to honor her, of course, but she insists I did it because of some creepy desire to control her. Uh, She's probably right. Uh, We've been married a very long time. I'm a lot older than most of the folks in the uni. uh, And I've long ago given up the idea of trying to make her do anything. She's just too stubborn and strong-willed, which I kind of like, actually. But as my alt character in Eve, Jaina was intended to become a hauler. I split her off in a new account and learned how to dual box two EVE clients at the same time. And uh, now my hauling empire could continue to grow while I could keep uh, learning and doing things in the uni with my main character, even during wartime. When peacetime came, uh, I discovered how valuable an alt character can be, mining with uh, my main character while Chano did the hauls back and forth to the station. That definitely greatly improved mining efficiency. I was able to fly a Hulk by then and was getting some very good production levels. 
But I realized that to maximize mining income, I really needed Jano to become an Orca pilot. Now, the Orca is a wonderful machine for miners. It has an awesome tank. It has huge storage capacity. And with the right modules, it can dramatically improve both mining laser range and cycles. It's also a great ship for hauling. In fact, anything stored in the corporate hangar is invisible to cargo scans. I had to have one. However, it takes a long time to properly train for it, and it's also very expensive, uh, about 500 million isk at the time. With fittings, the ship really can cost about 800 million to fly. Now, over three months, Jano trained up the skills to fly an Orca, uh, but I still didn't have the cash, so I cheated. I admit it. I freely admit to everyone here, I succumbed to the dark side. I took the quick and easy path. I sold Plex. Now, for about $100 in real money, actually, it's between $60 and $100, you can buy a game time code and convert that into uh, pilot license extensions, or Plex, which can be sold. Uh, if you spend 100 bucks in real money, it's about $1.6 billion isk in the game. I figured I could either build up the capital needed to buy and outfit an Orca over five or six months, which would be emotionally satisfying, but require more patience than I actually possess, or I could blow some real world cash and get the Orca immediately. I had the cash, so I got the Orca. I also bought a prorator blockade runner and some implants. <laughs> now, I have very mixed emotions about being able to spend real-life money to get ahead in EVE. Uh, Gasek asks, is that cheating? It is legal. You are allowed to do it. Uh, however, I will tell you from a practical perspective, all I really did was accelerate what probably would have happened anyway. On the other hand, I absolutely took advantage of the fact that I have sufficient funds in real life to buy pretty much whatever I want. And to me, that feels patently unfair. So I resolved never to buy and sell Plex again. Uh, I also admit that I am not so principles that I gave up the Orca and other shiny things that I bought. Uh, but the result of those purchases was that Jano's isk making potential as a hauler and a mining support character increased dramatically. Uh, paired with my Hulk, it was easy for Jano to collect and sell up to 10 million isk of ore per hour at virtually no risk whatsoever. I also used her to make some more risky courier contract runs in low sec and even a few in null sec using the Prorator, which is a fantastic blockade runner. Uh, if you want to do something that's exciting, uh, do some uh, do some trade runs in low sec and null sec in a blockade runner with people hunting you. Uh, one time, in fact, she netted 100 million isk in a single run, and uh, I could make money constantly even during wartime. And once again, my bank account started to grow, and keeping uh, between 300 and 500 million on hand wasn't difficult at all. Now, I can understand how valuable having an alt character can be in EVE. I can't imagine how I could have possibly generated a reliable stream of revenue in the game without one. One secret to riches in EVE, in my opinion, is focusing your characters on specific skill sets so they can become highly competent at certain ISK-making aspects of the game. Later on, that kind of specialization becomes uh, even more essential to your success. So if you're serious about making ISK and EVE, I think you need to have at least one alt character in a separate account, and you need to have a well-developed plan for how you intend to use them. Gasek asks, how many tunes do I have? I have two main accounts. Uh, I fly 90% of the time Neville and or Jano. And then the other four characters uh, that I have, because uh, uh, you can keep three in each account, uh, are actually stationed in trade hubs, which is very handy. And I use them to check prices and to buy and sell things. But they don't travel around at all, and they have no skills. Alicia asks, uh, Neville, would you say that if you intend to make ISK, you can say goodbye to training for combat and PvP? No, I would not say that, Alicia. I think it's very important for you to have combat skills. You're going to need standings to be able to maximize your ISK-making ability, to get perfect refine, to lower your taxes, uh, to make money for missions, for example. Uh, so you're going to need a certain amount of combat skills uh, to be effective in the game. And uh, as I said, I'm a cowardly player and very very risk aversive, but I found that uh, combat missions can be a lot of fun if you know how to fly them correctly and you have the appropriate skills. So I do think you need to have combat skills to make money, uh, to make a good, reliable income in EVE. 
Yeah, Nick's a good question. At first, isn't having two accounts difficult without real life money? Yes, you are paying for two accounts. However, uh, if you can get them focused and have the right skills and equip them properly to make enough where you can afford Plex, uh, they can pay for themselves. And uh, because they're both specializing in complementary sets of skills, it's a lot easier to make more ISK with two characters than it is to actually have one character, I think, in the game. Gisek asks, do I spend money to play the game? Yes, I do, although I certainly make more than enough ISK to pay for Plex and pay for the characters that way, and I've done that a couple of times, but I just go ahead and pay the subscription fee. Now, hauling and finding trade runs was fun. I got to see a lot of New Eden. I took a lot of side trips. I got to see the Eve Gate and the Monolith. Uh, and many other cool sites in the cluster in New Eden. Uh, but after hearing Turin Bay's excellent introduction to station trading, I figured that trade skills would also be a good thing for Jano to learn. Now, station trading can be very lucrative, especially if you have the capital to corner the market for a certain good for a certain period of time. But it takes a lot of study a lot of patience, and a lot of attention. Um, Basically, you're buying items from impatient mission runners, uh, for the most part, and other traders at low prices, and then trying to dump those things at higher prices in the same markets. You really make your money when you buy the right items, not necessarily when you sell them, which seems counterintuitive, but that's generally the way that it works. Now, there are three things required to succeed in station trading. The first thing is you must identify the right items to buy and sell. This requires a lot of study and some practical knowledge of what people really want in EVE. No one likes to buy shield flux coils very often, for example. Shield power relays, however, sell a lot faster. And the only way to know those kinds of things is to actually experience it in the markets or by studying the trend line graphs very, very carefully. And that's 90% of the success in station trading. The second thing is buying at the right price. You want to make money but you also have fees to cover in station trading. So you need to buy the right items at the right prices, which takes discipline and patience. The third thing that's required for station trading is attention to detail. Now you're competing with other players in the market. Essentially, it is a form of PVP, and uh, they're constantly sniping at you, reducing their prices by you know, one one-hundredth of an ISK lower than yours. You can't just set your price and walk away. You have to monitor it constantly to keep your prices competitive. Now, I will confess to everyone that I am a terrible station trader. I can never figure out what items I should trade. And even when I did, my margins were awful because I didn't buy at a low enough price or I couldn't pay enough attention to keep my prices competitive. One night, trading some power diagnostic systems and some reactor control units in JITA, I was watching my market screen with my head propped in my hands. If you think that station spinning is boring, try watching numbers decline by one one one-hundredth of an ISK every second and making price modifications every five minutes, which is the most that you can do it. And now if I ever have insomnia, I fire up EVE and start to station trade, and I'm usually asleep in less than three minutes every time. So to station trading expert Turin Bay and all of his ilk out there that are making money as station traders, I salute you. You're obviously all made of sterner stuff than I. However, it wasn't for me. Now, by this time, I've been playing E for about nine months. My bank account was solid. I had about 500 million ISK, but I really wasn't rich. Uh, I had tried station trading and failed. It really wasn't for me. Hauling was fun and reliable income, but it was about the same level of productivity as mining. I still didn't feel like I could get into level four missions with a battleship yet, which was probably, in retrospect, a needless concern. Uh, I knew I needed to do something different to get into the next tier of EVE riches, but I really wasn't sure yet what that was. Now, one thing I did know was that to succeed in EVE, your depth of knowledge about the various aspects of the game has to be deep. Uh, everyone that I've seen in this game that's been very successful is an expert in some way about some aspect of EVE and, or multiple aspects of EVE. So the more you know, the more you can maximize your ISK-making potential. And so I therefore resolved at that point to become much more knowledgeable about the game. Now, the best way to become a master of anything is to force yourself to teach it to others. So at that point, I became a uni teacher. My first course was EVE Careers 101. 
which was based on some research that I did on various ways to make money in the game. I then built a hauling 101 class using the process that I had developed from some research earlier. And every time I taught a class, someone suggested a way to make the syllabus better, give me some more ideas that I could try. And some people think that I teach classes because I'm a nice guy and like to share knowledge. And believe me, the reason I really do it is uh, not for such an altruistic reason. I learn more from teaching classes than any that the students uh, that choose to attend actually get from the class. I uh, really do force you to develop more expertise in the game. Now, I did want to know if people like the classes that I taught. Uh, so I took a cue from Deidre Val. Uh, he used to be the director of education at the uni. Uh, he once asked people to send him one ISK if they liked his electronic warfare class. And I really liked that idea. So I started doing the same thing. Now, two amazing things happen when you ask people to send you a tip. First, almost everyone sends one. And I get some very nice comments, which always makes me feel good. Uh, second, about one in every 20 students actually send more than one ISK much to my surprise. Uh, one student has sent me, uh, more than one student has sent me a million ISK each. Uh, one person sent me a comment saying, thanks for showing me the way, he commented uh, after a hauling 101 class that I did. Uh, one student sent me 10 million ISK saying, uh, I'll send you more after I get rich. And uh, he actually did, sending me another 10 million ISK about three weeks later. Now, I routinely record most of my classes, and I post them to our class library on the wiki. And you would be surprised to learn how many non-unis download and listen to our classes. I'd say just as many as people that are actually uh, in Eve University. And I estimate that altogether, over the last oh, year or so, I've earned about 100 million ISK in tips from classes altogether, which is not a bad return for something I would normally do for nothing. So, in fact, I feel a little odd about keeping those tips. So, last month, I actually donated them to the uni. I feel, felt it was the least I could do for helping me learn more about EVE. Now, there is no income in EVE like passive income, which is money you make while you sleep. And uh, if you recall, mining was kind of the first almost passive form of income that I discovered in EVE. But for a long time, I heard about data core farming, and EVE is a way to make about 100 million ISK or more a month without really doing anything. And that sounded good to me, so I decided to become an expert at data core farming. Uh, the way to do that was uh, to schedule a data core farming 101 class in the uni calendar, and I started to do some research. Then I found out that working with research and development agents takes an investment in missioning to get very high standings to get the best level four agents uh, so they can do research for you at levels high enough to actually generate some lucrative returns. So further, they require investments in certain science skills before they can do any research for you. So I discovered pretty quickly that that was not going to be as easy as I thought, so I postponed the class. But I had learned enough to develop a plan for becoming a data core farmer. And that part of that meant developing some high faction standing. So I began doing Cosmos missions. How many people here have done Cosmos missions? Give me a wave in the class.euni chat channel. Well, not that many of you. Uh, Cosmos missions are a great way to get um, faction standings. Yeah, Carithel, there are a special set of missions that you can run that uh, give very high faction standing improvements. Uh, you do have to be good at missioning, however. If you can't fly a battle cruiser and be able to do at least level three missions competently, uh, then don't try to do Cosmos missions. But uh, if you want to generate high faction standings, Cosmos missions are the way to go. If you do a search on the wiki, you can find out more about them. So starting to do those Cosmos missions forced me to get over my fears and finally buy a Dominix. And what a revelation that was. I felt like an idiot for not purchasing one earlier. Uh, although it's a lot slower than a Myrmidon, for sure, a Dami is like the ultimate missioning machine. I curse myself for waiting so long to get one. With a Dami, I chewed through Cosmos missions in just about no time, all the while learning the science skills that I needed for data core farming. I had Jano also develop enough skills to fly a battle cruiser with some help from my main, also pursued uh, some standings to access research and development agents too. Uh, soon she had enough high enough science skills and faction standings to get five level four agents working for her as well. So after about five weeks of effort, I had 10 level four R&D agents 
cranking out research points, netting close to 200 million ISK in incremental income, which is really not too bad. Now, it's a little tougher to make that level of uh, income from uh, data core farming today. Uh, depending on uh, what kind of data cores you research, uh, that can be as little as 50 million or you know up to about 100 million uh, ISK per month, pretty much just sitting around and collecting the research points and then cashing them in, uh, uh, collecting the data cores and cashing them in. So you have to pay attention to it today. It's, it's harder to do than when I did it uh, even a few months ago. Uh, but it is certainly possible to generate a fair amount of passive income by becoming a data core farming, and I do recommend it to everybody. And when CCP released the planetary interaction feature, it sounded like a nice semi-passive way to make some additional income. Uh, Fortunately, the Uni has the best guide for setting up planetary interaction. Uh, I studied it very carefully. If those of you haven't studied our planetary interaction guide on our wiki, it's the best out there, no doubt. Uh, I set up some operations on five planets in HiSec, and I arranged it so I could make some higher-level items, some higher P3, P4 items. And then I waited for the ISK to roll in. And uh, I'm sad to report that that did not happen. The demand for P3 and P4 items was not nearly as strong as I thought it would be. Also, planetary interaction increased the supply of those items, which drove down prices. In short, the only way to make good money on planetary interaction is to do it on more productive planets, which means going into low sec, and I wasn't willing to take that risk. So for me, planetary uh, interaction was another experiment in ISK making that failed, uh, but it really wasn't for naught. I did not uh, you know, do it to, to gain nothing. Later on, I reconfigured my planetary interaction colonies to produce pause fuel items, which turned out to be very useful, so I'm glad I studied it. Uh, but as a income source for me, planetary interaction is not, uh, not something that I count on. It is great for pause fuel. Saves a lot of money that way, no doubt. Yeah, Gene Jacques actually, uh, CCP does refer a lot of people to, uh, to our content on our wiki, especially for planetary interaction. So we actually allow them to do that. There are people that make good money on planetary interaction. I'm not saying anything about it. You do have to pay attention to it. It is semi-passive, and it's certainly a lot better than the ClickFest when it, when, it, when it first came out. It's a lot easier to manage now than it is uh, when it first uh, appeared on the scene, believe me. Uh, but it really it wasn't very lucrative for me. Now, an interesting thing happened along the way to setting up data core farms and learning how to do planetary interaction. Both of my main characters had studied science skills. Now, it occurred to me that I could put those science skills to other purposes, like doing invention and manufacturing Tech 2 items. I only needed to train up on some industry and production skills, and I was in business. So I put both Neville and Jano to work on developing some industry and research capabilities. Uh, meanwhile, my experience with Cosmos missions had given me some confidence to fly a Dami in level four missions, and I was really making some good ISK from level four mission running. And although I did lose a couple of ships, now I could afford the losses. Uh, Jano continued to haul profitably as well and run the occasional high risk courier contract in low sec. And at this point, uh, which was about 14 months into the game, I had 900 million ISK in the bank, and crossing the 1 billion mark seemed within easy reach. Unfortunately, at this point, I blew my savings on a freighter for Jano for absolutely no reason whatsoever. I don't know why I did it. She certainly had the skills to fly a freighter, but I really didn't need it. Uh, but the Providence is a really cool-looking ship, and I could afford it, so why not? And in retrospect, it was an extremely dumb thing to do. It wiped out almost all of my capital. Uh, All of my early experiments uh, with invention and manufacturing were going nowhere fast. Uh, It didn't look like it was going to be nearly as easy to make money being a manufacturer as I expected. I invested in a few Tech 1 blueprints and could make a few items, but none of them are really profitable. So here I had this big freighter with absolutely no cash in the bank whatsoever. I was learning that copying was the problem with manufacturing. There were just not enough copy slots in public stations, and most of them had several days waiting time at best. Any of you who have tried to find a place to actually copy your blueprints so that you can do uh, Tech 2 invention, it's very difficult to find slots that are available. So if I was going to make money as a manufacturer, the only way to really do that was to set up a player-owned Starbase, a pause. 
So I did buy a pause uh, after doing a lot of level four missions and earning some cash back. Uh, I was now about 16 months into the game. Uh, Chano had studied the appropriate anchoring skills to be able to uh, go ahead and set up a uh, player-owned starbase. Bought the appropriate, uh, uh, you know, the tower, a small tower, and a couple of labs, which you can do for about 150 million. It's not as much as you might think. Uh, setting up a, a a pause for research is not that expensive, and so uh, certainly we had the standings because of Cosmos missions to be able to set it up in high sec, and so I was able to establish a pause. Cost about 28 to 30 million a month to fuel the pause, uh, which is not a whole lot of money. So you can set up a pause if you have the right skills. The problem is having the skills to do something useful with it. And uh, so did set it up and set up the research stations. And now I could copy. And uh, I want to say thank you to Kane Saturus, who actually showed me how to actually do copying and do Tech 2 manufacturing in a way that was actually profitable. If it wasn't for Kane and a lot of help of other people in the uni who are doing manufacturing, Turin and others, Seamus has helped me on innumerable occasions with some details. And we have all kinds of people in the, in the uni who are far more expert at this stuff than I am, and you collect those hints together and you begin to see ways that you can actually make money. And pretty soon, I was able to start copying and make Tech 2 items uh, and focusing primarily on things that people use in missions. Uh, and now I routinely, on a regular basis, make somewhere between, oh, about 150 to 200 million per week doing a nominal amount of invention, building the items, and sending them off to Jita to sell, uh, which doesn't sound like a lot, but very quickly, you can amass a lot of wealth with, you know, just doing a few clicks and moving some things around. So definitely Tech 2 manufacturing. If you want to become a billionaire in this organization, uh, if you want to be a billionaire in uh, in the uni and, and in EVE, you must learn Tech 2 manufacturing and you must be able to put up a pause. Uh, that's the only way that I can see it. So today, uh, as of right now, I have about uh, just under $2 billion in the bank. And uh, generating routinely about 150 to uh, 200 million a week from Tech 2 manufacturing and shuttling, uh, doing the occasional hauling around, uh, get a few courier contracts uh, from time to time uh, for Jano to carry a few things in low sec, which is always fun. But, uh, you know, that's where I am today. Uh, my next step in conquering all of New Eden uh, is to uh, expand those capabilities. Uh, doing more, learning more about exploration. You notice I didn't talk anything at all about going into wormholes. I've only been in a wormhole three times. And I understand wormholes can be extremely profitable and, and very, very productive if you know what you're doing there. So that's the next step for me. Uh, certainly more risky, but, you know, when you have that much ISK in the bank, you're, you're, you, know, you feel good about actually taking those kinds of risks. Uh, so that's the path that I took to becoming an EVE billionaire. Uh, and I hope you found this useful. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the class.euni chat channel, and I'll be happy to answer them. And uh, if anyone would like to chat with me offline, and if you ever need some advice uh, about uh, what to do and not to to do these various things to start building an income for you in the game, I'll be delighted to, uh, to help you if I can. So with that... I want to say thank you for your attention. Uh, again, I hope you enjoyed me babbling on about my the things that worked and didn't work about uh, becoming rich in the game and uh, take some inspiration from it. Learn from my mistakes and uh, capitalize on the things that work. So uh, any questions, feel free to type them in the chat channel. Seamus makes a good point. Uh, wormholes can be very scary places, and you need to go with people who know what you're doing, so don't just dive one in. Anton asks, what ship do I risk hauling in low sec with? I only do hauling in a prorator. Uh, never take anything that can't be cloaked up in low sec. Never. Anybody who takes a uh, deep space transport or any kind of industrial is just asking for trouble. You will get, you will get caught. You will get webbed down. You will be blown up. Do not do that. So you must learn uh, how to fit a uh, covert ops cloak to be able to haul in low sec. Oh, Seamus asked, how did you help me set up a starbase? I asked you some questions. You don't remember this, Seamus, about pause fuel. You asked so you answer so many questions. You have you probably didn't even know it was me.
I was asking about what it would take to fuel a pause and how much you should uh, spend. And are there any resources for figuring out what there were? And, and you helped me with that. You directed me to some useful links for planning out uh, what it would take to set up and, and actually fuel a Starbase. Uh, All right. I, I probably told you how to show info on a control tower. There was that. Also, when I actually got the various, you know, like the tower, and uh, it's not the documentation and how to actually set up the components of a player-owned Starbase uh, are really not the most intuitive in the world. And so I know I talked to you and others about how do you turn these things on and how do you get the shield up and all that stuff, and you guys helped me through all of that. Uh, Lysak asks, how many exotic dancers fit in my hauler? Well, if you're talking about the prorator, uh, one of the cool things about the Amar uh, blockade runner is that uh, you can fit it to uh, get more than uh, 10,000 cubic meters, which is enough to carry cruisers. So it's just over 10,000 cubic meters. In the Orca, of course, gosh, I don't know. I think the, uh, I think my uh, cargo hold there is something like 74,000. And of course, then you've got the uh, ore hold, which I think is 40,000. And um, what else is there? The corporate hold is 50,000, if I recall correctly. I may be wrong about that. And the freighter today, um, I've got freighter four skills on Jano, and I think that's 884,000 cubic meters. So that's a, that's a lot. Yes, uh, Sheen Jocks asks, do we have a good wiki for assembling a pause now? Yes, there is a great article on pause and you, which is on the university wiki. Uh, do a search for it. In fact, there's a couple of good guides there now that weren't there when I first uh, started to set up the pause. So we've uh, added quite a bit recently on how to uh, set up research pauses in HiSec. Also, Turn Bay is teaching a class now on getting started with Tech2 manufacturing and how to set up a player-owned Starbase. And there is a recording of uh, an early version of that class on the wiki and the class library, too, so you can listen to that also. And he'll be doing that again soon, I'm sure. If not, I'll do it. And with that, we're going to close off and say thank you very much for your kind attention. I hope you got something useful out of this. And uh, good luck and fly safe. <laughs>